Let me ask you to take your Bibles tonight and let's turn to the book of Colossians this evening. Colossians chapter 4. Tonight we just want to take a few minutes before we go to prayer to consider another passage like we've been considering the last few weeks that instructs us as God's people in prayer. We find ourselves, I think, if we're not careful, beginning to think that we've mastered something because we know a lot about it, but knowing a lot about something is very different from being proficient in it, uh, from doing that which would bring God the most glory in an area. And so prayer is one of those things that I think if we're not careful, we can lose sight of how important it is and how much God actually says in his word about it when it comes to instructing our hearts and minds. And so we've given the last few weeks to studying text. We're going to give a number of more weeks as well, working our way through the New Testament, considering what our Lord says through his apostles, what he himself said. And we want to do our best to bring ourselves in a line with these things. Well, tonight I want to begin by reading our text, Colossians 4. I'm going to begin at verse 2. I'm going to read down through verse number Six. There's a couple of short paragraphs that are put together here and some instructions from the Apostle Paul at the end of this letter. We read there these words. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. As I mentioned in this passage, the Apostle Paul was giving some closing admonitions to the Colossian church at the end of this letter to them. And I want you to note at the beginning of the passage we just read how he gives us an unmistakable call to prayer. There's there's no questioning that's exactly what he's doing. In verse 2 we read, continue steadfastly in prayer. I don't know about you, but brethren, I have to acknowledge the fact that over the years, I have found that my prayer life often comes in seasons and cycles, in fits and starts, right? Times in which I sense my desperate need of the Lord and find myself regularly, consistently praying, and other times where I'm actually doing all right, and there's money in the bank, and life's pretty good, and there seems to be relative peace, and the next thing I know, I find myself not intentionally avoiding God, just by the fact that there's not a lot of pressure right now, not crying out as much as I once was. I find it fascinating that the Apostle Paul, seeming to know well by the Spirit's inspiration, the bent of the human heart that does not continue steadfastly, to use such a word in his instruction to the believers concerning how they are to pray. He says, don't be shaken from this. Don't don't walk away from this. Don't start and then stop. No, continue steadfastly in prayer. Be people who are marked by prayer. Lives that it's clear are are, are governed by an understanding that you need God and that he meets the needs of his own. This is the word from one who clearly understood his need of prayer. And we know that because he very quickly turns the attention of their prayers back toward himself. He says, then pray for me. As you pray steadfastly, pray for, pray for me. This is not one who's sitting back saying, now you need to do something I don't really need to do. No, he's saying, I want you to do something, and when you do it, I want you to do it for me. He understood personally that desperation for grace. 
Don't, don't miss, as it were, in the second half of this verse, what we might call the, the call to vigilant and thankful prayer. In the second half of the verse, he says, there continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. As he instructed them in prayer, he told them, this is something you need to think about. You need to be aware of what you're doing. This is not something you just kind of whisper a prayer in the morning and whisper a prayer at noon and whisper a prayer in the evening to keep your heart in tune, as we used to sing. No, this isn't just, just you know, whipping one off right before, we pray, right before we eat so that we get it done, right? It's how, I mean, how often have you and I found ourselves engaged in what we call prayer only to realize halfway through, I'm not even sure what I just said. Because I'm not even thinking about the words. How many times have you found yourself in the Word reading the Scriptures only to find you're a paragraph or two or three or a chapter or two or three in and realize, I have no idea what I just read. My eyes passed over the page, but I'm not attentive. It's not intentional. I'm not being vigilant over my soul as I'm engaged in something we would call a spiritual discipline. And yet many times we are engaged in the discipline, but it's not very spiritual because we're not thinking. We're not, we're not engaged in what we've been called to do. He says, no, as you continue steadfastly in prayer, be watchful in it. Be intentional about it. And he says, if you are, it's going to be marked by something. Notice that. You're going to pray, and if you're watchful in prayer, you're going to be someone who prays with thanksgiving. You're going to pray as as a grateful one. You and I often pray as desperate ones. We often pray as needy ones. In fact, I can tell you, sadly, my own testimony would have to be, yours I think would probably echo mine, how often we pray as selfish ones. But brethren, do we pray as thankful ones? That we realize that God, this glorious God over all, this sovereign Lord, has so graciously, so mercifully, so lovingly, so generously bestowed gifts on us that when we find ourselves crying out to him consistently, watchfully, steadfastly, we are doing so thankfully because we recognize that all we have are gifts of grace. Paul instructs us when we pray, he instructed the Colossians, and by his instruction to them, by extension to us, he teaches when we pray, we do so consistently, we do so vigilantly, intentionally, and and thankfully. This is the kind of prayer that he, he instructs. This is helpful for us to consider whether or not when we pray, when we engage in prayer, we are being marked, our prayers are being marked, our hearts, our souls are being marked by the very kinds of things that the Scriptures instruct. When we engage in prayer, we should be thinking like this, speaking like this, responding to God like like this. It's interesting that after his initial instructions here in verse 2 concerning prayer. Paul then goes on to ask, as I already noted, the Colossian church to pray specifically that God would do something for him. And he prayed, he asked them to pray that God would open a door. Now, now brethren, I, I would say that that's probably not a strange request among us, that God would open a door. We ask him to open doors of opportunity and we ask him to open doors in education and open doors in our workplaces and to open doors for us. And I mean, I remember when I was trying to get back here last year, when our family was trying to get back quickly and, and we actually had a prayer meeting before I went to the travel agent office. And, and we as a family bowed and prayed, God, would you give me favor with the agents? What was I praying? Open a door. We need your supply. Would you lead us to just the right place? How often do you and I pray for open doors? But I love this. The Apostle Paul's prayer was not merely an open door generally. Or even an open door specifically, but selfishly. 
What he asked them to pray was for an open door for the word. For the word of God. What a thought. Look at verses 3 and 4 again. What do we see there? At the same time, pray also for us. That God may open to us a door for the word. To declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I'm in prison. (laughs) That I may make it clear. Which is how I ought to speak. There's a lot here, and we're not going to take a lot of time tonight, but I do want you to think with me for a few moments about what he was actually saying here. He was asking them to pray that God would open a door for the ministry of the Word, that they could declare this glorious mystery of Christ, this one who is God, who came in the flesh and who died for sinful men, who who was crushed by his own Father and then raised back to life as evidence his sacrifice was sufficient for the forgiveness of sins. This mysterious reality that honestly to the human mind makes no sense at all is not clear at all he said would you pray that I would have an opportunity to declare this reality in such a way that it would be understandable it would make sense to the hearers so that it would be clear not muddy not foggy but abundantly clear And the implication here is so that it might be believed. Wow. You see, Paul understood some things that I think we need to understand, brethren. And this is not the only place he says such things. In fact, he he says something very similar in another of his letters. He used very similar language to express the same dependence on God for the fruitfulness of the proclaimed word. And he does so in 2 Thessalonians. You may remember these words there. Finally, brothers, he says there, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored. Not merely that it would go out and it would be unhindered as it goes, but that it would actually be received and honored by those that receive it. And he says this way, as it happened among you. I love that. He says, brethren, what has God done with his word in your life? What did he do to change you? You heard the word and it changed everything. Would you pray that when the word is heard by others, it would change them completely too? I wonder sometimes if you and I intercede for sinners in the same way we would intercede for our own children. In the same way we would want for people to intercede for our souls, were we still lost? How do we pray for those who have not yet believed this word of the Lord? How do we pray for those who have initially believed, but now need to believe some more things and be sanctified by it? How do we pray for the ministry of the word? As it goes out. I think if we're not careful. We can begin to think that it's just kind of mechanical. The word is preached and it is believed. The word is preached and it is believed. As if somehow just the act of preaching. Is all that's required for the transformation of souls. And what is Paul saying? There's something else that's needed. He says I'm going to keep preaching. (laughs) But there's no guarantee I'm going to preach to open hearts. Because what is he saying? I don't, I don't change hearts. I can't make people receptive. I, I can't give them clarity of understanding. I, I, I can't make them believe. So he prays, he asks the Colossians, he asks the Thessalonians to pray with him that as he preaches the word... Hearts would be prepared by the sovereign to receive the word given by the sovereign. 
I wonder if you and I have that same understanding of the dependence we have. That God goes before his word into our spouse's heart or our children's hearts or our grandchildren's hearts or our extended family members' hearts or our neighbors' hearts, our co-workers' hearts. You see, what Paul is getting at here is that as the word goes out, and yes, brethren, it needs to be declared by us. But more than declaration, there must also be with declaration an utter dependence on God to make the declaration fruitful. And so he says, when you pray for me, would you pray that God would go before his word, open the door, open the hearts, make them ready so that they receive it, they understand it, and it changes them. They actually honor God as they hear his word. Thessalonians, he says, and, and pray this too, that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men. Because there's something we have to acknowledge. Not all have faith. What's, what's the issue here? You see, we think the greatest issues in our country are all policy issues. Brethren, those aren't the greatest issues in our country. They're important, but they're not ultimate. He says, what are Christians praying? They are praying that we would be delivered from, from wicked and evil men who are wicked and evil as a demonstration that they have rejected the faith of Christ. The ultimate issue is always a soul issue. It's always a gospel issue. Paul acknowledged this and said, when you pray, would you pray with, a, with an understanding as though the Spirit of God has pulled back the curtain so that you can see what's going on behind humanity, behind the powers that be, behind what's going on in the world, and realize the issue here, when we are opposed, the issue's just not policy and the issue's just not culture, the issue is a soul that has rejected the faith of Christ. Not all have faith. What's the implication here? So pray they would believe. Pray they would hear the gospel and trust in Christ. Pray that these who now don't have faith would come to faith by the work of God in them. See, a lot of times I know we pray for a lot of things, but I, I, I wonder when we pray is this how we pray? You see, Paul keeps bringing it back to the same reality. It's about the soul. It's about faith to respond to the word that's declared. It's about an open door in hearts that right now are hard. It's about God doing a sovereign work in the souls of men and women who desperately need to be saved. It can only be saved by a work from him. I wonder when we pray, brethren, do we, do we pray like this because we believe like this? Clearly, Paul understood that the truth of the matter is that our proclamations of truth will prove fruitless unless God prepares the heart, implants the seed, and gives the increase. We can do the work, but we can't save the soul. We can't convert the sinner. We can't sanctify the one who needs to be made holy. Only God can do that. So what do we do? We, we express our dependence. God, if you don't, our work is in vain. Our work's in vain. So please, God, Sovereign Lord, do your work. So that as we do ours, what you've given us to do, it proves fruitful 
for your glory. Though Paul asked for prayer for his own preaching, it's interesting to note that he followed up that prayer request for his own preaching and ministry and his team's preaching and ministry with instruction concerning the witness that all believers are to have toward outsiders. I love this because he, he says, hey, continue steadfastly in prayer. And then he says, and, and then pray for me. So does I preach that there's an open door for the word and that God does his work. But I want you to notice how in that very next short paragraph, this application, he moves it and he kind of turns it as it were around on those he asked to pray and said, by implication, what you're praying for me, I want you to pray for yourselves. Notice what he says in verses five and six. Walk in Wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech, right? So you pray for me. My speech is fruitful. My preaching is fruitful. But let your speech now be always gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. In the first half of this paragraph, or the first half of this passage that we're studying, Paul asked believers to pray that his speech would be fruitful and clear. But in this second half of what we're studying, he calls all believers to speech that is both gracious and wise. Gracious and wise. You see, he, he says this, you, you walk among outsiders, they're not in the faith, right? They're not believers yet. And you and I need to have wisdom how we walk among them. If you and I think that it's no big deal, we haven't read much of Paul when it comes to how we interact with the lost. We think, well, not, not, not an issue. You know, I, I got this. <laughs> What's he say? No, no, you're... You're in danger of walking foolishly. Walk in wisdom among outsiders. Be careful. Be thoughtful. Be intentional. Be biblical in your interactions with them. And notice what he says. And don't waste time. Don't waste time. And when you think about your interactions with unbelievers, do you think about what is the best use of time with them? Because that's the context of what he's talking about, right? Making the best use of the time. I must confess that over the years as I've interacted with the lost, I've been often too convinced I'm going to have plenty of time with the lost. There will always be more time with them. There will always be another opportunity. And, and so we can just kind of hem and haw and, and drag our feet and move slow. And friends, I'm not saying be foolish. This text says be wise. But it also says we need to make the best use of every opportunity. That means thoughtful, prayerful, biblical, intentional thinking about how to navigate those circumstances so that we make the best use, not just an okay use of the time. The best use of the time. And he goes on to say that one of the best uses of your time is making sure that what you say is filled with grace. Filled with grace. The fact of the matter is most of the lost people you know don't know many people whose language is filled with grace. They just don't. They don't know people who speak kindly, humbly, mercifully, lovingly, graciously. The way you and I should speak as representatives of Jesus is different from the way most people speak. And I wonder if we realize that. 
If we consider that as we we navigate life, notice gracious speech seasoned with salt. The idea here is speech that's palatable. A speech that, that's not tasteless, it's not bland, it actually is something that people latch on to and go, there's something to that. Over the years, I have loved to consider the example of people in history who have talked often about Spurgeon's rec- uh, recognition of the, the Bible that came out of John Bunyan. If you read John Bunyan's works, and Spurgeon said, if you, 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 you cut this man, you prick him, he bleeds Bible. It just, it just comes out of him everywhere. He said, you read his Pilgrim's Progress. It's like reading the Bible. It's just Bibles everywhere. There's something different about Bunyan. I wonder, is there something different about you or me? My mom worked in a Christian school in Guam. You guys know this for years on the island of Guam. She, she worked in a school, and one of her jobs for years was to actually interview all of the new parents and students that were going to come into the elementary school. So she would get to sit with them, and she said, every person who came through the doors of the school, I got to give the gospel to. And she said, I, I wrestled. I wrestled through the years with how to do that. And, and she said, I, I knew that they were coming from all different kinds of religious and ethnic backgrounds. And she said, I, I knew very quickly I could stick my foot in my mouth without even meaning to. And she said, one of the things I d- tried to do was to commit to memory the scriptures and to just present biblical truth without feeling the necessity, which is often driven by pride, to, to also say chapter and verse, right? I, I know, I, you know I, I'm going to tell you where it comes from. Because I've got it mastered. It, it, many times that's a pride thing. She said, I'm just going to give him truth. And she said, over the years, it was fascinating to watch how many times she would just quote the scripture or speak the scripture to people without telling them that came from the Bible. Just weave it into her conversation. And she said that people across the desk from her would say, wait, 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 hold, on, hold on, hold on. What did you just say? And she would say it again. And they'd say, say that one more time. And she'd say it again. And they would say, that's truth. They didn't know she was quoting scripture. They didn't know where it came from. But they knew truth when they heard it. And I wonder, friends, do you and I? Are we so confident in the words of God that we realize that the power of God is in the word of God? Not my arguments. I wonder, are we people whose speech is filled with wisdom and grace, seasoned with salt, so that we know how to give an answer to everyone when it comes to the questions that they ask us. Why do you believe this way? Why do you live this way? Why do you think like you think? Why do you and your family do it differently from every other family I know? Why are you like you are? Do you and I have an answer that is biblical and gracious and humble This is what Paul's talking about. Being a people who's so dependent upon God that when we speak with the lost, that humility, because we know we don't have the answers, but he does, just flows from us in a winsome, gracious, loving way. If you think that what I'm suggesting is that there's never a time for confrontation of wrong, you know me better than that. And you know Paul better than that. But what is Paul saying here? A man who is in prison as he writes for the sake of the gospel. You don't think Paul's willing to be confronted or or to confront? He's in jail for this. Pray for me. and Pray for yourselves. That the word of God would go forth from us and bear fruit. And bear fruit. Brothers and sisters, it should be clear to us as we read a text like this one that we must engage in the ministry of the word of God dependently, boldly, precisely, graciously, wisely, 
And we could continue with the descriptions. This text is abundantly plain. As we turn our attention to prayer tonight then, let's, let's cry out to God from hearts that are steadfast, watchful, and thankful in prayer. Steadfast, watchful, thankful. And let's cry out to God from hearts that joyfully intercede for those who minister the word. So he said, pray for us that the word may have an open door and that we speak with clarity. Pray for those who minister the word. And let's cry out to God from hearts that are convinced of our need for divine grace for the work that we each have been called to. That's each of us, not just the preachers, but all of us as witnesses and as ministers of the word of God in a world that knows not God. Let us pray as those who are convinced of our need of grace for the work that we've been called to.